I uh, have this favorite quote of mine. I think when I, when I talk to people about NaNoWriMo and invite them to do National Novel Writing Month, I hear the two most often uh, her excuses that I hear is people say, I don't have the time to write a novel in a month, and we're going to talk about that today, too. Um, or they'll say, and this is like what I, I find more uh, disturbing, they'll say, oh, I'm not a creative type. And I happen to believe that we are creative types by definition. Being a human being is being a creative type. And I love this uh, quote from Pablo Picasso. Um, and I, I think about it a lot because it's easy to lose yourself in adulthood. Every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. You know, when we get to be adults, everything's about practicality and, you know, I don't know, money, bills, things like that. And I think it's easy to trivialize those creative aspects of our lives and not value them as highly as we should. And so I hope you leave uh, this session tonight like empowered to write your story and to make it a priority. Because um, the danger is, as Mary Oliver said, the most regretful people on earth are those who felt the call to creative work and who felt their own creative power restive and uprising and gave to it neither power nor time. Sometimes I, when I do these classes, I have people write down, this is something you can do outside of uh, this session, but to really think about why you write, why it's important to you. Because in those moments where you're facing the pain of writing a novel and finishing it, as you told me, um, or when you wake up in fear or self-doubt, remembering that why is really important. And I think the why for most writers is not to become a bestseller. That's a nice end, end to, to things but it's really to get the story down on the page. That's what's gratifying and makes, makes it a gift. So I think one thing here is I want to mention um, is this, this, this chasm between ourselves and our, and our favorite writers. I think so often people say, I'm not a real writer because I'm not published. Or other people write books, not me. Um, and I certainly went through this myself. You know, I grew up in this small town in Iowa where no one was a writer. I'd never met a writer before. And then when I went to college or moved to San Francisco, you know, I would occasionally meet people who had published books, but they were just kind of these, these other people who had pedigrees and qualifications. And, and so I didn't think that I could necessarily be a writer, because that was something that other people do. And I always liked the, this, this quote from Maya Angelou. I'm still amazed by it. Um, or, or intrigued by it. She said, I have written 11 books, but each time I think, uh-oh, they're going to find me out. Now I've run a game on everybody, and they're going to find me out. And here she is one of the most, was one of the most celebrated, before she died, one of the most celebrated American authors. And she read like a poem at Barack Obama's inauguration. You know, she's super important, super accomplished, but she can still, we all have this, um, writers especially, I think, have uh, a certain anguish and self-doubt that can lead them to think that they're not legitimate, they're not real. And I think part of it is also that writers face so much rejection. It's part of being a writer. Either you're rejecting your own words, as you were saying <laughs> earlier, they didn't look good once you read them, um, or you're rejected by a publisher you're submitting to, or you might even be, feel a sense of rejection when you're showing your work or sharing it with like friends and family. So it's, it's, it's a big task, and I think you've got to like just remember that so many people, even people like Maya Angelou, wrestle with that self-doubt. Um, but I think, um, do people know what the imposter syndrome is? You feel like a phony among those people who are real somebodies, and I think a lot of authors feel this before they get published. And let me tell you, you think publishing will solve all of these problems? It doesn't. <laughs> you still have the same self-doubt and possibly imposter syndrome after you're published, just like Maya Angelou did. And I think authors, as I said, are especially susceptible to this because like a lot of writing is, is facing rejection and overcoming it. Um, but the one thing I think is like the worst thing about imposter syndrome is that it, I think it, um, it, it relates to fear as you were talking about it. It, it, it. it stands between you and the page in a way that you're not going to do your best writing. Because I think the best writing comes from being brave and from being vulnerable. And if you feel like you're an other person, somebody who's not entitled or doesn't have the certificate to be a writer, you're not going to be as naturally brave on the page. Um, so, for me, there's one definition of writer. It's not somebody who's published. A real writer is somebody who sits down and writes every day, who takes responsibility, as you put it, for writing. Um, so, if you doubt yourself at all, tell yourself you're a writer just because you write. 
And here's another good thing. If you don't feel like you've got the pedigree or, or haven't taken classes or training in being a writer, don't worry about it. The less you know about a field, the better your odds, Jerry Seinfeld said. Dumb boldness is the best way to approach a new challenge. A lot of people, like when they start something, you learn by doing. Like you can't learn to write a novel. You learn it by writing a novel. You, can't, you can take an infinite number of classes about how to write a novel and you won't learn it until you do it. So trust in that. So I want to address a little bit that chasm between inspiration and responsibility. Um, I think inspiration is a funny thing because a lot of uh, writers I talk to, uh, they wait for those big, what I call the big thunderbolts of inspiration. Do people know what I'm talking about there? It's like that kind of inspiration that's, that it, it does feel divine. It's a really rare kind of moment where you're in the shower and you get this glorious idea, right? And, and, and it happens to me about twice a year. <laughs> so I feel like if I wait for that inspiration, I'll never take the responsibilities you put it and sit down and write. Um, it's funny because I think we have this, this concept of the muse and it comes from, it actually does come from a divine source. This comes from like, I think uh, 1300, uh, the etymology is, is that inspiration's given to you. It's something that comes from the heavens and just kind of like, like magically um, appears to you. Um, and and, and it's, uh, the, the old French said it was like inhaling air, like you're breathing in something from the world. And I like that definition a little bit better because you're breathing in, bringing something in and changing it within your being. Um, but I think a lot of people like get hung up on this notion. The Greeks, the Greeks, there were like nine Greek goddesses who they called the Muses. And again, the author here, this is a Rembrandt painting. The Muse whispers it in the author. So the author is receiving things. It's kind of like you're lucky to get this story. You're lucky to find inspiration. It's it's good fortune. Um, but I think like those big moments of inspiration are so rare. You're not going to finish a book waiting for those. And so. Inspiration, writing a book is all about not the big eye of inspiration, but the little eye of inspiration. And the little eye of inspiration, I think you create yourself by sitting down and writing every day. And it's like the shuffle of words on the page and your involvement in the materials of the world. Words, like, I, I feel like I, I think about it as these magical sprites are popping out and helping you write the story and helping you create that momentum. Um, this great quote from Toni Morrison, a writer is either compelled to write or not. If I waited for inspiration, I wouldn't be a writer. So one way at NaNoWriMo that we try to ignite uh, in, uh, that, that type of inspiration that guides a novel every day is through this framework of a goal and a deadline, which we think equals creative magic. And the goal and deadline that we use for National Novel Writing Month is 50,000 words in 30 days. You can modify this goal for any type of product, writing project um, you're doing. For instance, National Poetry Month this year, I'm writing one poem per day for the month of April. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, the, the, but the main thing is, is, is that this goal and deadline, it helps you from waiting for those big moments of inspiration and sitting down every day and taking responsibility. Um, so I think, you know, when we talk about writing a book, goal and deadline are rarely mentioned. We talk about elements of craft and how to write suspense and how to write, you know, great plot or great characters. But none of that happens if you don't develop the discipline. And I think. Uh, with a goal and a deadline, it helps you, helps you create that. Uh, Joyce Carol Oates said, getting the first draft of a book, novel, finished, is like pushing a peanut with your nose across a very dirty floor. <laughs> I think that this gets to what you were talking about when you mentioned the kind of pain of writing a novel. It's tough. Every time I, I write a novel, even though I've written them before, I'm amazed at how tough it is, you know? And I, I, have deeper and deeper respect for those people who can even finish one rough draft, let alone revise it and publish it. Um, but the, the NaNoWriMo experience, doing a novel in a month, it helps you push that, you know, pushing a peanut across the floor is an unpleasant thing. So why not get it across the floor as fast as possible? And that's why we say write a novel and in, in, write 50,000 words in 30 days. It doesn't matter what you write, you've just got to get that peanut across the floor and then you can, you can clean up those words and revise them later. So before I did NaNoWriMo, for instance, the first year I did it, I'd been writing for a long time. Um, but the way I found that I wrote is that I wrote with this kind of ponderous preciousness, as I call it. Like I would, I would write the first sentence or the first paragraph over and over and over again until I got it perfect. And then I'd move on. And I'd like, you know, perfect the first chapter. 
And I wouldn't move on until I had that perfect first chapter. And, and, and the thing that I didn't realize is that I was spending, you know, a lot of novels have like three acts in them. And so I was probably spending about 60% of my writing time on the first act, 25% uh, on the second act, and 15% on the end. So it was a very inefficient way to write a whole novel. My novel would start out good and then just get worse and worse <laughs> as you read it. Um, but I think like the constraints, like we, constraints are, is a word with a negative connotation. Every writer I know wants more time. They don't want constraints. They want, they want, uh, they don't want jobs. They want, they want plenty of money so they can sit and write and focus on their novels and bring them to fruition. Um, but constraints, if the first bullet point was here, uh, it takes away, it, like it restricts you in a way that it makes you make choices. So. The reason a goal and a deadline works with NaNoWriMo, one reason for me is that it, it, I know I've only, I've, I, I need two to three hours a day to write the 1,700 words to help me get to 50,000 words. So I have to cut things out of my life. So I might have to give up social media for a month. I might have to give up Netflix for a month. I might have to wake up earlier for a month. But that constraint helps me make those choices and prioritize my creativity. Um, and, and I've noticed something is that sometimes uh, when people have expanses of time, they actually don't use it as well. Um, and so I have this premise that how many people, how many people here are busy people? Everybody raised their hand, right? We're all busy people. And busyness is like part perception and part reality. But I think we all have more time in our lives um, that we can find, if, especially with a goal and deadline will bring it out. In fact. Um, Ray Bradbury, I love this story, he wrote Fahrenheit 451 um, on his lunch breaks during his job. So he had a half an hour, and he used that half hour, and he, you had to like buy time at UCLA to use their, their, the library to use their typewriters. So instead of getting on the computer here, you'd put in a quarter, and, and so he would maximize his time and type as fast as he could for that half hour, just in a burst. So if anyone t has lunch breaks that lend itself to, to writing, you can put in a half hour a day. That's probably about three, 300, 500 words you could write easily during that break. Um, and I think like the constraints keep perfectionism from nailing away at you. Um, if you know you have to write 1,700 words a day for NaNoWriMo, uh, you're not gonna let that perfectionism hold you back. I mean, part of the thing is getting over it because you're, you're focused on the forward progress of your writing. For a rough draft, I think, one, like liberating yourself from that sense of perfectionism or that's gonna be good, helps you write in, in, in those moments that I say are, um, I don't know, le less inspiring, I guess. Um, and I'll just tell this, I can't, I can't remember where I have this story in my slides, but I'll tell it now. It's one of the most inspiring stories I have is that Toni Morrison, before she was a published novelist, she wrote her first novel and she was a single mom in New York City with I think two kids. And so she was very busy, very constrained. So after working a long, hard day, she came home, she took care of her kids, she got them to bed, and she had about 15 minutes before, it was, before she needed to go to bed. And so those were, just, just think, that's, that has to be the worst creative 15 minutes for creativity of the day for her. But that's how she wrote her first novel. She said, I'm gonna write, that's the only time I have, and I'm just gonna write for 15 minutes a day. And, and the reason I like that story is it shows, one, how we can find time in our busy lives to write, uh, but two, how big things are created with small increments. You know, it's, it's just like putting one pebble on the, the, the pile of rocks every day, and it does build into something. Um, so, again, I think this is later on in the presentation, but I'll just mention it now. Like, think about it. Two, if you write 250 words a day, which for me might take, I don't know, let's say 15 minutes, half an hour, even if I'm writing really slowly, I know some people who do it like in two or three minutes, though. Uh, but 250 words a day for 30 days is uh, 7,500 words in a month. So if you write 7,500 words in a month, that is uh, 90,000 words in a year. And that's a, a big, this is not even 90,000 words. So there's a novel. You can write a draft of a novel in 15 minutes a day. And so I think like sometimes, sometimes as writers, we don't do the math. And this is like where the golden deadline come in. And I want you to do an exercise later on where you'll, you'll go on a time hunt in your life and you'll figure out how much time do I have? How many words can I write in that time? Whether it's 30 minutes at a lunch break or 15 minutes before bed, or I'm a morning person, so I try to wake up an hour before my kids do to write. So I think it's like, as writers, 
we need to really think uh, how, to, how to strategically pro approach our time and use it for our creativ creativity. Because these days it's just so easy to dawdle it away, right? I mean, like if you, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, these are, these, these devices have killed many a novel, right? I think, I go, well, I'll just, I'll just say this, that, because um, I was, was wearing a Fitbit earlier, and a Fitbit is like, like, like if people, do people know what a Fitbit is? It like tracks your steps, so the goal is, for me at least, 10,000 steps a day. So one thing I like about having that goal and the deadline is that sometimes I'll come home and I'll check my progress, and I will have walked, I, I, I thought, I'll, I'll think I'm near 10,000 steps, but I'll be at 6,000 steps. And so it prods me to go out and walk those next 4,000 steps before going to bed, kind of like Toni Morrison. And I think that can work for your writing, too. Because like we, on the NaNoWriMo website, we have like uh, word count tracking graphs, so you're entering your word count every day and seeing how far below or above your word count you are. So you'll know, like if you have a goal of, of 1,000 words a day and you're at 600, you know, you'll use that 15 minutes before bed to try to get those next 400 words. It's a, it's a great motivator. Um, the reason I stick up for routine is kind of for this main point, is that you're clicking on because you have to, because you're sitting there. A lot of writers say, even if you don't have any if you really feel like writer's block, you mentioned, like I forget which writer said this, but he said that even when he's blocked, he makes, he makes himself sit at the desk through his whole whatever it is, two or three hours. And, and usually by just sitting there, something happens. It might take 15 minutes, but something happens. Something clicks on. And the writer I was going to reference here is uh, Stephen King. Has it, have people read his book on writing? It's, I, I feel like it's one of the best books on writing. And what he says... He says that um, having a writing routine is sort of like having uh, a sleep routine. You go into, at least if you have a house as big as he does, I don't, but you go into, a, a, you, you have your office, right? You have your room, you have your desk, you have whatever it is, wherever it is you write. And it's kind of like when you go in your bedroom. Your mind, your mind is switching into sleep mode when you go into a, your bedroom. You might have a routine, whether you've planned it out or not, where you start reading a book, and that helps make you sleepy. And he says the same thing about sitting in a certain place every day, is that, that when you sit down to write, things are happening, happening mysteriously in your brain. Your brain is getting right, ready and primed to, to bring out a story. And so that's why I think a routine is really important. And working with that goal and, and uh, deadline approach helps you develop that routine, because you've got to show up every day to hit your word counts. Um, so we're going to go five, five steps to make your goals work for you. And then we're, we're going to do a little exercise with time hunt. But, um, uh, the, the main way, one of the, the first reasons people don't succeed in NaNoWriMo is that they don't strategize how they're going to use their time for a month, or, or how to find the time, rather. And that's where the time hunt comes in. And we're going to do this a little bit later, but what you do is you detail a typical day, and, and you go through it, like, I'll write down, I do this every year, in 15 minutes increments, how you spend your time. And it will be, they have apps for this too, so you can use apps to get even more precise or to find out how you're spending your time online. Um, but I have this premise that most people can find either that 15 minutes that Toni Morrison found or two or three hours, which is what I need to do NaNoWriMo. And then what you, what you do is once you find that like, whatever, hour block or something, you think about how many, how many words can you write in an hour? So let's say you can write 500 words. Let's say you made a goal that you want to write a novella that's 30,000 words long, and you've got to find the time to do that. So if you can find an hour in your day, and if you can write 500 words in a, in a day, then look out into the calendar and see how long it's going to take. And then I can't do the math in my head, I'm sorry. But it's one way to help, it helps you be, be, be accountable. It helps you develop the routine. Um, in NaNoWriMo, we find that the, the peop, like there's a, there's a drop off after the third or fourth day for people will miss their word count targets for a couple days. So they might be like a thousand words behind, and then they'll quit entirely. Um, and so with, with any, especially when you're writing a book or a novel, don't let those lapses derail you. Either reset your goals or, or, or find a way to, to catch up with those thousand words. And then we find with NaNoWriMo, announcing your goal and deadline to the world, like the best way to quit smoking is to tell people that you're qu quitting smoking. Because then they're going to hold you accountable or even if they're not holding you accountable, you'll feel their eyes on you. So we advise people to announce on Facebook um, or to tell your friends individually, I'm writing a novel. I want to write a novel this year. I want to finish it. Um, just by voicing that and telling people, you'll, you'll, you'll have a built-in system of accountability. 
and you'll get to this state, Dorothy Parker, you might hate writing. She said, I hate writing, I like having written. Um, and I think a lot of us sometimes don't like that first moment at 5 a.m. But I, I, I'm an early morning writer too, but by 6 a.m. when I'm done, I'm so glad I did it. Yeah. So let's set some, how many people, do you want to set some writing goals for this, for this year or for this month? Okay, let's do the exercise that I did. Let's take five minutes um, and real quickly, I'll just keep a time here, um, map out a typical day. Just think about where, you, you don't have to do the whole time, time hunt with 15 minutes increments, but try to map out how you spend your time now and where there are pockets of time that you think you can write. This will be the most valuable tool you have as a writer for the rest of your life, I promise you. And if you've figured out how much time you have to write, um, think about just word count. How fast do writers are you? How, how many words can you write in, say, an hour or a half hour? Uh, one person is writing. So we make sure we have time for everything. Are people done? Yeah? Good. How much time did people find? Did anyone find 15 minutes in a day? Yeah? Half hour? Hour? How many words? For those of you who did an hour, how many words do you think you can do in an hour? Before people do, we, we advise our Young Writers Program students to like actually do it for an hour and see, I don't know if a lot of people know that, I can write about a thousand words in an hour. And I'm mainly talking about a rough draft generator right now, and this is like kind of using that NaNoWriMo principle of, of writing faster rather than slower. And there are creative benefits to that too. I mean, one creative benefit beyond, besides getting the novel done is that I think by writing in a more improvisational style, you're allowing those ideas to get out, you're restricting your, or getting rid of your inner editor, which we're gonna talk a little bit about as well. Um, I guess like this is a hard exercise to do here. I, I, it, normally, if I had more time, I'd flesh it out and have you actually write for like five or 10 minutes and see what that was like and then use the tally. The main thing I think is like to, to when you, set up a reasonable goal and then think about finding that, those pockets in your life where you can write a certain amount of words. And obviously, there are good days and bad days. Some days the writing's flowing and you write 2,000 words in an hour and sometimes you can only write 300. But, but the main thing is to like be, hold yourself accountable and also find that time in your life to prioritize and to do it. So I definitely want to emphasize that. Um, do people know what an inner editor is? I just mentioned it. Yeah? I can give a more honest one, which is, uh, huh. oh, maybe I'm wasting my time. Maybe I'll never get the book out. I mean, I don't know whether it's like an inner editor or inner blocker more. I think the inner editor can take a lot of forms. You, you said that it was like a, a lot about like editing your your, your words yeah, so that you're. It's also questioning and doubting myself. Exactly. I think it. And that is probably the deeper issue. I think so. I think it's so easy. One of the tough parts of finishing a novel is getting over those moments of self doubt when you're hearing that voice telling you you're not a real writer or this isn't this prose isn't sparkling or this story doesn't have suspense. Whatever it is, um, I think like we all. I think it's almost impossible not to have that voice, and so the challenge is, is like, how do you deal with that voice when it comes into your head? Um, for me, it's like, yeah, I wrote down a few things. It tends to be a demanding figure who tells, tells you you're doing it all wrong, right? Like, what do you know about a novel? novel? How do you know how to write one? Um, sometimes I think it's like, um, it's, and it's not offering any constructive advice either. It's just, it's just a naysayer. Um, for me, it compares like your prose to others and shows you how they did it, but with the purpose of kind of belittling you. And this is where I think sometimes, when I write a rough draft, it's so far away from my favorite author's rough drafts, or even from my best drafts, uh, or finished products, rather. So I, I would love it if we could all see our favorite author's rough drafts instead of their final products, because I think it would be an amazing learning experience. I, I bet we'd have epiphanies, because I have this theory that no matter how good a writers they are, their rough drafts are crappy by definition too. They're very similar to ours. And the only reason they got a lot better is because they've either practiced a lot or they've revised a lot and they've had help from their editors. You know, um, We don't see that finished novel, everything that went into it. So 
that's why we say banish your inner editor, um, and you'll be able to write more and write better. Um, the other thing here, the, uh, the third bullet point here, it's a basically a collection of all your fears and insecurities as a writer, which is what you mentioned earlier. Um, does anyone know, do you, do you know the term creativity wound? Have people heard that or creativity scar? I think we all have in, a, in, in some way. It's, it's when somebody in your life has told you something hurtful about a creative project you've, you've done. So a lot of kids will get it like an art class, for instance, if they're, or they'll feel it. Um, they say that there's a, there's a point where kids stop being artistic, or a lot of kids do. Um, it's, their brain develops to the point that when like, they draw a tree, if it doesn't look exactly like the tree they're drawing, they, they see that gap between their, their, their sketch and the actual tree, and they'll tell themselves, I'm not an artist. But, but usually it happens when somebody else has like, told you. And so like, when I got my MFA at San Francisco State, um, I, ha I stayed an extra semester just so I could take a class with this famous author who I liked. This is a dangerous thing to do as a writer, because <laughs> oftentimes famous authors don't really want to be teachers. Um, but she just eviscerated my writing, you know. She said things that were, you know, like she wrote no shit in the margins, things like that. You know, things that were obviously not, had no intent of helpfulness and, and it was deeply wounding. It was the only time in my life where I just could not get off the couch to write. You know, I just totally shut down creatively. Um, and then, you know, later on I, I, I found out that she dealt with everybody in the class like that. Um, and it, that helped a little bit, but hearing somebody's negative words when they're really hurtful about your creativity, it, it, it's, it's like a mulch where, where your inner editor grows up into a dragon, essentially. Um, so we all have, I think most writers, unfortunately, go through that experience to some degree. Um, but we have, uh, in our Young Writers program, we tell the young writers to draw their inner editor before writing a novel. And so this is a drawing from this boy, Graham, and the thing I like about it is, well, he, he, um, he's drawn all these arms and legs. And so your inner editor can attack you from multiple angles, multiple sides, and with, even with different objects. Like he's got the dictionary in one hand and an eraser in the other hand. And so, um, yeah, and then we tell them, wad it up and throw the inner editor away. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it, the concept of an editor, I, I mean, I agree, banish, banish the inner editor in the rough draft but also learn how to deal with that inner editor, that inner naysaying voice. Um, and this comes from Brene Brown, recognize the difference between perfectionism and healthy striving. She defines perfectionism as when you're, when you're doing something for other people's judgment. You know? So I sometimes think about when I have guests come over to my house, how I kind of fearfully clean, because I don't want them to see what a messy person I actually am. Um, but healthy striving like, would be more where I'm just looking at my prose and my writing and trying to make it better for myself, trying to make it match my vision, not writing it for somebody else. Because when you're, when you're, when you're doing something with a perfectionist tendency, you're doing it, there's, a, there's an element of fear there. Um, I advise people to sit down and really decide on a strategy for your inner editor, which is really like, when, when are you gonna be more welcoming to those voices, especially those voices who are gonna help you make a better sentence? You know, there's a time and place for that uh, in, in revision. And then, I also think your inner editor needs to know that sometimes you just need to be liberated entirely. There's a time to chase wild ideas over hills and dales of your imaginations, and, there's, and there's, then there's a time to refine things. And so you just have to define when is that inner editor welcome, and when does that inner editor need to, to leave the room. So, um, you mentioned writer, was it, who, who mentioned writer's block? You did, yeah. So let's talk about, I, I want to, um, I don't believe in writer's block. And the reason I don't believe in writer's block, I think a lot of writers kind of, well, will fetishize it, um, kind of celebrate it in a way, even by announcing it and saying it's there, you're putting a block between your, your, your ideas and, and words on the page. And I think there, there are easy ways to get over it, and I'm going to mention that. Um, we're going to talk about some of those techniques. Um, Ray Bradbury, when he first became a writer, he, to, to, to discover his stories, he wrote down um, a list of 20 nouns, just random nouns that came into his mind. And then from that 20 20, list of 20 nouns, he would write little tiny essays, like he wrote 100 or 200 words. But you wouldn't even have to write that many. And then he would like look at all those essays, um, or those little tiny snippets, and that's how he discovered some of his initial stories. 
Like it was all about like these things were like coming out of his subconscious. And that's the way he wrote the book, um, A Wicked Way. The, what's the title? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Something Wicked This Some, Way Comes. Something Wicked This Way Comes. There it is. You get, you get the prize. Um, so yeah, so the, the, that's just an example of how, how he's, he's creating something from the mulch of his, his subconscious. And, and, if it, and he might have had writer's block, but just by that act of writing and exploring his mind, a story sprouts up. It's, it's, it's magical. Um, oftentimes, like when I'm staring at my uh, laptop, in that moment at 5 a.m. where I don't think words are going to come, I do what I call right outside the story. So that means either sitting down and not writing on my laptop, just putting words on a page. There's something about that tactile sensation and that more slow pace that sometimes brings something out. Uh, sometimes I'll go right in a different spot, like not in my room, maybe in a cafe, um, just someplace different because different um, in environments spur uh, different thoughts. Um, I also have become a big fan of writing prompts. And so like, I, my, my, my side life to NaNoWriMo is I run this literary magazine called 100 Word Story. And each month we put up one photo and we invite people to write a story about that photo. And so I have this dream of, of planning out a whole novel with, with a photo or a writing prompt at the beginning of every chapter. And that would be like something to write to and to spur thoughts. Um, but they don't have to be pictures. They can be, um, they're, they're whole books of writing prompts that you can buy. You can Google things on the internet, or Google writing prompts on the internet and get great ones. Um, and the reason I mention this is because we have this NaNoWriMo tradition of doing what we call word sprints. Has anyone participated in a word sprint before? Yeah? Is so it's like a free write, like a book write? Pretty much a free write. The thing is, like, it is that concept, again, of banish the internet editor and just write and just write anything that comes to your mind. Don't worry about punctuation, just write. And the amazing thing about it is, and this gets to the magic of creativity, is that I have led, you guys, I hope, I hope you guys won't disprove this because I've said it so many times. I've led hundreds of word sprints. I've given a simple prompt. I've never seen anyone not be able to write. Usually people have written at minimum 50 or 100 words. Sometimes if they're on laptops, as many as 500 words. So we're gonna do it today and I hope that no one has writer's block. But this is something that you can do yourself at home or at NaNoWriMo, like we have, on, we have a whole Twitter account dedicated to at NaNoWordSprints. And so during NaNoWriMo, there are word sprint people operating that 24 hours a day. Um, and if you go to our write-ins, that's how, like something like this, we would be giving like word sprints for you guys to help get your words on the page. So this is like just, and, and to your, you said improv, I think like, they do have a very improvisational um, writing structure. Like improv is all about saying yes and when you're on stage. So if the actor does something, you're receiving that and building on it. You're not saying no. Um, so you go with it. As Tina Fey says, you can't be that kid standing at the top of the water slide overthinking about it. You have to go down the chute. Um, so get your improv muscles going. Um, and then I think like also like don't get hung up on, on any sort of messiness. Karen Russell. She has this great quote, I definitely think that if you can make peace with the fact that you will likely have to throw out 90% of your first draft, that you can relax and almost even enjoy writing badly. And that's because the first draft, the writing badly, is about experimentation. That's where you're gonna find your story. Um, and she's right, every writer I've talked to, 90% of that first draft gets cut. It's necessary to write it, but a lot of it's gonna go away. So let's do a writing sprint. Are people game to do one, try one? Good. Um, so the object is to write for five minutes. I'm gonna give a prompt. Write as fast as you can and see how many words you can write. Write for quantity, not quality. We have a saying that qu quantity can produce quality if you let yourself go. So here's the prompt. It is, we smelled the smoke before we saw the flames. Okay, time. The next part of this is, can you, um, so it's a little bit, usually when people have laptops, of course, it's easy to get a word count. Um, can you estimate how many words you wrote? And the way to do that is to write, count the words on any given line and then multiply it by how many lines you wrote. So two things. I don't know, this is why I don't believe in writer's block. Because that was just a random prompt, right? It just dropped. 
and you guys all, did you, what was your experience like? Did you actually write, end up writing a story? Yeah. Like a story formed yeah. out of those simple words that you didn't know anything about? And just impromptu, just in real time, you came up with something, right? Like that's just the magic of creativity in your brain. You just have to open up the pathway a little bit and things come out. Um, and I, I, don't want, I don't mean to diminish writer's block, by the way, because I know it's a very real thing to some people, and I know especially if you are depressed or have, have trauma, you know, it's like it's really hard to, to write and find a way to write through that. I, I just give this exercise as a way to, you can do this yourself any moment you feel blocked in order to push your for, story forward. You can use your own prompts or join an NaNoWriMo group like I, I mentioned. Um, well, I, I, I'd initially planned for just an hour of material there. Do, do, do you guys want to like stop and, and, and take questions? This next section I put in there in case I had more time. And it's, it's, it's talking about planning a novel versus pantsing a novel, uh, is what, which is you know, writing by the seat of your pants in NaNoWriMo or something in between. I found in NaNoWriMo we have this discussion or this kind of ongoing debate about whether you should plan, which means meticulously outline your novel ahead of time, or whether you should just show up and write it. And there are benefits to each that I'm going to touch on. There are hazards to each, too. Um, like, I think one thing, like, I view it like it's kind of like travel. I don't know if you guys are planners. You can think about how you plan in the rest of your life. If you're a planner in the rest of your life, you're like most likely want, going to want to plan your novel. But like, if I was going to go to a trip to Paris and I was a planner, you probably know these types of people. They'll read all the travel books ahead of time. They'll, they'll know all the restaurants in the neighborhoods and the museums they want to go to. They'll plan out a whole itinerary. And the benefit of this is that when they go to Paris for those two weeks, they see and do everything they wanted to do because they've got it on a time grid. Um, whereas if you're pantsing, you kind of just show up. <laughs> you, know, you show up, you check into your hotel, or you find a hotel once you get there, and you kind of just open yourself up to the streets of Paris. And you might know that uh, the Louvre is a museum you want to end up at. But you're more, um, you might not see as many things, but you might find those strange and interesting experiences that a planner might not find, for instance. And that's the way I at least kind of think about it. Um, so I think there are, there are benefits to planning. I think it gives you um, a sense of control. Like you, in, in planning, I'm thinking of, there are a lot of different ways to go about it, but just like an outline. An outline that goes through every section of your novel, every chapter, every scene in the chapter. You know, so you can get this whole kind of map of what's ahead. Um, one benefit of planning is that once you have that whole map and outline, you know the ending. So all of your writing, you can think about foreshadowing, how to build suspense, how you're going to pace things once you know the ending. It can help with that. Um, it can give you like less chance of writer's block, because if you have an outline, you, you know where the story's going. So when you wake up at 5 in the morning, you know, OK, there's this chapter to write. I've got it planned out. Um, and there's less chance of going wildly astray, which for me is, is it, it's, it's a hazard of, of writing a novel. Like I, I love putting flashbacks in novels. I love putting backstories in novels. And not that that's bad, but, but it can be very kind of inefficient. And I'll follow little tangents in a lot of different directions, most likely a lot of those might get cut. Sometimes, though, they lead to great things. Um, I think sometimes one benefit of planning is like when you have the outline, you can spot problem areas. Like you can get a sense of that trajectory of escalation in your writing and be like, OK, you know, halfway through the second act, there's, there's, there's a problem there. There's not enough conflict. There's not enough rising action. So it can be an efficient way to write. Um, R.L. Stein, the guy who sold about a billion children's horror books. He said, no one likes to outline. I'm not sure about that. I know people who love to outline. But I can't work without one. He says, I think that's one reason I'm so prolific. I take a week and I plan everything. I do all the thinking beforehand. And so he just needs that to feel creatively secure. He needs that to kind of have that roadmap and write to that. Um, he's also, yeah, really prolific. On the other hand, uh, Stephen King, who's equally as prolific, uh, doesn't plan his novels. He wakes up and just pantses them. So it's, it's not like there's one approach that works. I think you have to find the approach that works for you. Um, benefits of pantsing. I think, like, for me, when I outline my whole novel, it starts to feel like a business plan and not a journey. And I happen to think that, like, writing is a journey and that there's magic in that journey. 
Um, and so I feel like my outlining puts kind of like, like kind of like uh, corners me sometimes into the structure that I've predetermined that I'm not writing freely. Um, with an outline, I think you can become like a translator instead of a writer. Like I think again of that travel metaphor. Um, where I'll get a map of the city, and if I'm wandering around the city, uh, what I find I do is I'm looking at the map more than I'm looking at the city. And, per, and, and to, to make that analogy into writing, if I have an outline, I'm looking so much at the outline that I'm putting blinders on. I'm not looking at the wider story and all those possibilities. So some of those tangents I was mentioning earlier that I love to, to tr um, follow, the reason I love to follow them is because they lead to unknown places. And I think a lot of stories are the best when you've taken those wild leaps of experiments. Um, yeah, so pantsing opens you up to kind of creative experimentation um, and uh, allows you to take risks. And, and, and planning also, I know a lot of planners who, as opposed to R.L. Stein, they love planning so much that they are always planning novels. They're always researching novels, but they're not writing novels. And so I think people, planning can become an excuse not to write. And there's this term in NaNoWriMo where we call, you know, People identify as planners or plotters or pantsers. I identify as a planter. So I'm somewhere in the middle. And I, have, I, I like to know a little bit of the direction of the story, but I don't like it determined in an outline. I still like to explore. But I, do, I will write little sketches, little chapter uh, synopses, um, and, and, a, and just the vaguest, kind of sketchiest outline. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of somewhere in between. And, and my method of, of planning is really the, the month before uh, NaNoWriMo, during October, I just take a lot of little notes. I'm always carrying a moleskin journal with me. And when I get thoughts on the way to work, this is, again, a way to use your time. Like, if I get thoughts after I've taken my kids to school, I pull up to work, and I spend five minutes just jotting down those notes. You know, and then I type them in later. Um, every writer is constantly I, needs to experiment with their process, I think. And for me, like I, I told you before, I was this ponderous, precious writer. And the reason I did NaNoWriMo was to shake up my creative routine and my creative process and just to write faster instead of slower, just think things like that. And so I always advise people, I don't know, we all have our proclivities, and it's good to honor those proclivities and those strengths. And once you find a way, that's great. But, but I still think, you know, every time I start a novel, I try to do one thing differently, you know. And I still think if you're a pantser, try plotting and planning your novel once. If you're a planner, try pantsing it once. They're just good creative skills to have. And outlining, I didn't mention this, but outlining can be a very creative act unto itself. It's kind of like a big, a big brainstorm of a novel. Um, let me see what else I got here. Um, so yeah, this Chang Ray Lee, this speaks to, to kind of more of the pantsing approach, but he says, part of writing a novel is being willing to leap into the blackness. It's like spelunking. You kind of create the right path for yourself, but boy, there are so many points at which you think, absolutely, I'm going down the wrong hole here. <laughs> and I think even if you're outlining, as a writer, you are going to go down the wrong hole sometimes. Um, but, that's, but, but you have to go down the wrong holes to find the right holes. Um, and you'll find those right holes later, uh, probably in revision. Um, so you just got to jump in. Are people familiar with this um, diagram? It's always good to get a revision of the time. Well, I've got mixed feelings about this, to tell you the truth. So it's the three-act structure. You know, you have a beginning and inciting incidents. You know, character has a desire, and then there's conflict, and then you know, the action rises up until this, like, climax, and then there's this descending action, or the, you know, it's, it's like a roller coaster, essentially. You're going up slowly, 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 slowly. It's all full of suspense. You get to the climax, you're about to die, and then you kind of coast in. Um, the reason I don't like it is because I, I guess I'm just not, um, I, I talk to a lot of people who struggle with plot, and I struggle with plot, and this has never helped me plot my novel. I guess it kind of does a little bit, that roller coaster, ride. Um, but when people like talk about planning and structuring their novels, I try to, I, I actually think that you can keep this in mind and then do other exercises that you layer on top of it. So this is one of my favorites, um, is that you break your, your story structure up into three sentences of three words each. And so this maybe works a lot better for a fairy tale like Cinderella, but it's like Cinderella can't go, right? She can't go to the ball. She goes anyway. And that's act two, and act three, she gets the prince. Of course, there are things in between those, 
But it, the reason I put this here is that you could, I think, take a novel idea that you're doing and do the same thing with it. Try to summarize the first act, the second act, and the third act in just three words and, and um, three sentences. And then you'll have a beginning, middle, and end. Um, so I just wanted to mention a couple exercises like that. Um, this is my favorite exercise, though. Uh, novel writing is essentially, or storytelling, is just an exercise in what if. You know, um, what if I was late coming tonight? What if um, I talked to a certain person on BART? And you know what, what I mean. You know, one what if leads to another what if. So you go into a scene or a situation, and usually you're changed by that, and that creates another what if. So I think a novel is just built on hundreds of what ifs. And so I advise people like when you're at the beginning, like one planning exercise is just to put what if at the top of a page and just do one big brainstorm. Write what if and, and write 100 different scenarios. You don't have to use them all. It's mainly just an, an improvisational exercise to help you conceive of the novel. Um, so yeah, what if somebody gets fired? What if a marriage or relationship implodes? What if somebody gets a disease? Um, just put in those wild things into the novel. And Nabokov has this <laughs> great quote where he says he treats his characters like galley slaves, which is what he means that he, a lot of writers can be too nice to their characters. Like conflict is what drives a plot. So in some ways, uh, Nabokov is saying, is, is saying like be mean, mean to your characters. Like re readers are reading for conflict. So, so get the conflict in there sooner rather than later and then have the characters grow, develop, and react to that conflict. Um, and just go to go back here like, to the three-act structure. So what I do is like after that game of what if, if I'm planning a novel, instead of doing it in an outline, I'll write all those what if scenarios on little post-its, and I'll put them on, on the structure here. I'll be like, here's act one. There'll like be five, six different post-its. Here's act two, and keep doing it. And then it helps me like visualize the story differently. It puts different pressure. It's just a different way to go about structuring it instead of an outline. Um, and then I can also move those post-its all around. Um, and there's software. Uh, like I then translate it to the software called Scrivener. Have people heard about Scrivener or Storyist? There's a lot of great softwares out there. Storyist and Scrivener were both developed during NaNoWriMo by writers who were using Word and thought it was horribly insufficient for writing a novel, so they coded new software and brought it out, so both great softwares. Any questions on the planning, pantsing topic? I'm getting, I'm getting a sign that we're getting crazy movements. For, yeah, that we're, any, any final questions? I think I'm being told that we're out of time. Yeah? No questions, all right. You're leaving, you're, you're certain you have all the knowledge you need to, to write your books, to wake up every day and be inspired, to write for at least 15 minutes a day like Toni Morrison. So thank you for coming. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.